Okay. So you're now being recorded. Uh, that said, I do have some standard disclaimers. I'll skip to my standard disclaimer. Sometimes information or images of unpublished findings are presented here. So all presentations in AGP rounds are considered to be confidential, not to be shared outside of the meeting without the express consent of the presenters. Everything I present today, you're free to use, steal, uh, relate otherwise, and we'll ask the same of any other presenters. Um, I thought it would be a good opportunity today to remind everyone who are AGP anyway. So the Academy of Genomic Pathology, which uh, you are now all a part of, uh, was originally established as the faculty of the Center for Genomic Pathology, which Bob Cardiff established here at Davis to have a primary educational mission in the area of pathology of the mouse and animal models of human diseases. So originally, uh, if you wanted to be a part of AGP, and I do encourage you all to put it on your CVs, I think it's important, um, that meant that you were agreed to and do agree to contribute content to the teaching mission of the center. So stay tuned. You all will be asked again to continue that contribution. We are getting our coursework tuned up and put back online um, and will be accessible for your students or your colleagues and collaborators that maybe have no experience in pathology, but you'd like to give them some. So that's who AGP is. Um, and without further ado, um, everything you wanted to know about ACE2, but we're afraid to ask. And so why ACE2? Um, just a brief uh, introduction to the disease here, the clinical pathology of a patient. We'll start with histology. And uh, I thought these images were among the best that I could find from an autopsy patient with uh, coronavirus. And um, you can see this um, lung disease is characterized by, um, at this point, fibrosis, but also with acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, hyaline membranes, the whole nine yards. In this case, hemor hemorrhagic changes and inflammation have also come in. And um, here's some hyaline membranes in G, um, some viral inclusions, we think, maybe. Um, and uh, we can come back to these pictures if we want to, to try and see if we can create mouse models that mimic any of this. Um, in that paper, they also showed the immune infiltrates, and um, in a different paper, some immunostaining for two antibodies, one against spike protein, the S1 protein, and one against the nucleocapsid of the virus, looking at lung tissue for cells that are infected um, in this um, disease. Electron microscopy shows what these guys look like. You can see the little red arrows. These are the little viral particles. Um, inside of the cytoplasm at this point. And so I started thinking about, of course, like everybody, viral entry and what was known about that. And that's where the ACE2 comes up. So um, the cell surface receptor ACE2, which of course stands for angiotensin converting enzyme 2, uh, there is an ACE1 as well, um, was identified to be the, um, the surface receptor in the initial SARS uh, virus and seems to be a common receptor for most coronaviruses. Um, um, and we can talk about MERS and some other things perhaps, but um, based on the work from the original SARS virus, this ACE2 uh, protein and the interaction with the SARS-1 spike protein was characterized and there was a lot of this kind of uh, description of it. Um, they actually crystallized the interaction of, uh, of the spike protein with the ACE2 protein to understand better how it interacts. And I won't get into all the details, but the binding domains between the two proteins are known. And um, a variety of sort of partial explanations for how this all works have been given. Here's one, but the one I like better is this one. And so this one shows um, down here at the bottom the binding and the relative importance of the cleavage events that happen. So there's a furin cleavage that happens and a temperus. A lot of you have heard about temperus 2 being involved here, temperus cleavage. 
And so what appears to be happening is after this temperous cleavage, there's exposure of a part of the spike protein that was not previously exposed, and that's what, what is allowing the transmembrane uh, transduction of the virus, um, or at least, you know, adherence, sort of permanent adherence to the, the membrane. And where this happens is still, I think, up in the air, whether this happens actually on the cell surface or within the endosome. So I think somewhere in binding, this can be endocytotically taken up. And then later uh, in the process, this um, fusion uh, recognition allows the transduction, at least that's my assumption. Apparently there are other mechanisms, sort of mystical, nobody knows exactly how they work, where endosomes become um, intracytoplasmic and the cathepsins have been implicated in that process. Um, okay, where was I going with this? Um, so a few things to know. Um, obviously, the first thing I wanted to know was where is this ACE2 gene actually expressed? And I don't know if you're like me, but one of the first places feedback that I go is, uh oh, here we go, is Human Protein Atlas. And so in Human Protein Atlas, what you can see here right away is that the gastrointestinal tract, and here you can see it on the surface of the colon, but if we were to look at the small intestine, um, you can see very nice expression in the mature epithelium in the small intestine. I think this expression pattern um, is largely you know, at the luminal surface, sort of towards the uh, gut lumen. And, um, less so in the areas uh, of the crypts down deep where the stem cells are. And so I think this is a reasonable explanation for the finding that patients with coronavirus infection are getting a mild uh, GI uh, kind of symptoms. Um, they, they don't typically get too severe. There are examples where more severe infections occur, but my presumption here is that because these cells are being sloughed off rather uh, rather quickly that um, the, the viral susceptible cells in the gut are not so much the problem, but a loss of barrier could still occur that would give you a secondary infection. And so there are patients that do very poorly with very severe um, GI symptoms, um, but those are uncommon. A Couple other interesting places to look before I go to the lung and the trachea, um, the brain is interesting. And we may come back to this. So in the cerebral cortex, um, there is some expression in neurons. Come on. It's thinking about it. There we go. So, you know, I think it's faint, but I think there is some real expression in neurons of ACE2. And uh, that has been described um, in other contexts, but here you can see it in Human Protein Atlas at some level. Um, if I go back, go to lung, start with nasopharynx. Nasopharynx, not very impressive, actually. I don't know, you tell me if you see a cell that's positive there. Maybe up at the surface, there's a little bit of expression, sort of like we saw in the gut. That may be enough for the nasopharynx. Um, but importantly, in the lung, in the lung, um, you can see some detection of ACE in macrophages. I never know if macrophages in the lung are real staining or some sort of background. Oops, stay up there. Um, and then I think you can in some areas, and it's easier to see actually if I pick one that has fewer macrophages, I think you can see a rare cell that's positive. And so as I look around in this rather pristine lung tissue, um, arguably you do get an occasional cell in here that has a little bit of expression. And so um, based on that, and um, one of my collaborators I've been working with a lot came out of Barry Strips lab, um, he showed me, this paper is interesting where they took human lung tissue and they did single cell RNA sequencing of it. 
and they tried to ask which cell types had expression of uh, this short list of proteins. And so at the top in the red box is ACE2. And so uh, when they dissociated the individual lung cells and they identify them with other markers um, that characterize the, each of the cell types, um, you can see ciliated cells here and then you see AT1 cells and this cell type, AT2 cells. Now, um, these are violin plots. So the way to look at these is if there's a lot of expression, like uh, if you wanna look at CD68 in macrophages, almost all the macrophages are positive and there's a, there's a colored violin in the background here. Here, you can't see a colored violin and that's because the colored violin would be down at the bottom. So most AT2 cells are actually ACE2 negative, but a subset of ACE2 AT2 cells are the ACE2 positive cells. And so this I think is interesting that it's actually a very small cell population in the lung of the AT2 cells uh, that are the, the source of ACE expression, at least by RNA. And of course they could express uh, the message and the protein could last as those AT2 cells differentiate. Um, so then, then the question is what are AT2 cells? And so that's this figure. AT2 cells um, are over here at the far right-hand side. Um, they're the, depicted as the plumper alveolar lining cells. And the concept here is that they are the cells um, that are more stem-like or progenitor-like in the alveolar population. And the AT1 cells are the more differentiated uh, alveolar cells. And so as you might expect, um, AT2 cells are actually increased in number in the setting of chronic lung disease because they're trying to, um, they proliferate in an attempt to repopulate the alveolar lining. Um, so all these other cell types uh, are not really the target. It's this, this progenitor-like alveolar cell that, and only a subset of those, and we haven't figured out what's in common about that subset. We're trying to mine that single cell RNA-seq data to try and figure out what else we can say about that subset of AT2 cells. So that's an area of inquiry for us. In any event, um, that's, that's pretty interesting when we start thinking about modeling um, this disease in mice. And I'll go back to the PowerPoint briefly. Oh, I actually had that. Um, so, um, the next question, of course, is where is AT2 in mice? ACE, excuse me, ACE2 um, in mice. And, uh, and then related to that, uh, how similar is the um, ACE2 protein between mouse and man. And so you guys probably already know some of the answer to this. If you look um, carefully at the homology, um, they're not super homologous. Uh, good old fashioned sequence alignment. And uh, this is tailored to the places where um, the human ACE2 uh, coronavirus binding sites are known to be and where the Tempris 2 cleavage site seems to be. And so um, the cleavage site is pretty similar, but the binding um, site uh, between human and mouse is significantly different. So the next question um, I asked is how conserved even is the human um, gene? And it turns out, uh, and hopefully I can find the right window for you all, it turns out that there's a lot of heterogeneity of the human, where did that go? Uh, ACE2 gene, there's, there's polymorphisms, and this has been, because this is angiotensin converting enzyme, this has been studied in a lot of detail by the people doing hypertension research. And here's just one of many papers showing um, genetic polymorphisms that are associated with the central hypertension, uh, the polymorphisms in ACE2 um, are, there are many that are in common uh, between different 
uh, racial backgrounds, but there's some that are unique to different racial backgrounds, which um, is an interesting thing to think about. Um, and I think it's an open question as to whether different polymorphisms in human ACE2 have um, more significant binding, more susceptibility to coronavirus versus um, more resistance. And there was in the original SARS um, epidemic, one study that looked at that. They only identified two coding um, sequence polymorphisms that they knew about at the time, and they did not find an association uh, to the susceptibility of viral infection related to those. Um, but I think that there has to be more to our thought process, and I would say we need to put this in a bigger picture context of knowing both what is the, um, what is the individual person's AT2 cell population number, as well as what is their um, ACE2 coding sequence, and um, is that more sticky or less sticky uh, than um, other polymorphisms. So there's one other thing to know, and um, I think this is an interesting little side note. Where is ACE2 coded. So ACE2, it turns out on the mouse is on the X chromosome and on the human is on the X chromosome. Uh, this to me is interesting. We're seeing internationally, we're seeing about twice as many deaths in men than women. Um, and this fits with my polymorphism heterogeneity uh, resistance versus susceptibility hypothesis because um, what this means, of course, is that a man will only have one copy of ACE2, where a woman will have two, and that may offer her some heterogeneity that allows um, better resistance. Um, AT2 cells, for example, that express the more resistant form of ACE2 could um, survive better and provide more um, lung re-epithelialization. So, I'm sure I've prepared more to tell you guys about, but I'm gonna stop there and um, let other people share some images. Um, I don't have my own slides from these mice yet. Uh, Kent Lloyd apparently is getting several of these mice in. Oh, I will say I do have, um, as an introduction, the original, some of the original papers. Uh, and you guys have probably all looked at these, but this paper is the one where they introduced the um, human ACE2 gene under control of a large fragment of the mouse ACE2 promoter region. And so they get a relatively normal distribution of ACE2 expression, theoretically. Um, with um, and, and characterize that. The other uh, paper, and I alluded to this in the invitation to you all, um, is the one with the K18 promoter. Um, that's this one. Um, I would say this is sort of the most commonly used or planned to be used mouse that I've seen. Um, and there's Obviously, there's kind of a couple of problems in my way of thinking with um, K18 expression of ACE2. They do show um, this figure where the non-transgenic and the humanized uh, K18 ACE2 uh, get similar sort of bronchial infection by virus. Um, these mice, even though we wouldn't think that K18 was going to be expressed in brain, they get very severe uh, encephalitis with the virus. Um, there's some description about whether uh, this is just viral cell death without encephalitis or a true encephalitis, um, and we can talk about that. Um, you guys probably know if we were to look at human expression of K18 in the lung. Um, 
it's kind of everywhere. And then I won't show it to you, but interestingly, there is a difference between mouse and man in this regard, uh, with mouse actually having less expression of K18 in lung. So here's human, and you can see, I don't know, I'll pick this one, I guess, because it's got bronchi as well as uh, alveoli, that um, both the, the bronchial lining cells as well as the alveolar lining cells are very K18 positive. In the mouse, in my experience, and again, I could bring up a, uh, an image of a slide if you wanted to see it, uh, the expression in the alveolar lining cells goes way, way down. And so you see tracheal and bronchial expression, uh, but not alveolar lining cell expression of K18. Um, okay open for questions or discussion, and then we'll move on to uh, Jerry and Stephanie and anybody else that has good stuff to show us. Uh, Sandy, uh, yes. you dealt with gender differences. What about aging? That's all. Um, yeah, uh, I, think it's a, I think it's a good question. And I, I tried to look at the Human Protein Atlas, which does have the age of the patients here to see if there looks like there's a difference in, in normal lung in an older person uh, with respect to AT2 cell and ACE2 expression. And um, I, I don't really see a difference, but it is still possible that, you know, I just have a limited sample and I'm not seeing it. Hey Sandy, it's George Thomas here. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, also looking at the, you know, we've all been focused on ACE2 and the lung, but actually if you look to the protein atlas, it's high expression in kidney and also highly expressed in kidney cancers, highest expression. And so, and if you look at sort of the patient population, you know, in what sort of is killing them, there's a huge number of them are, are actually getting kidney failure and then going on to dialysis. We don't hear as much as the ventilator need, but the needs for dialysis is just as high. And I think that sort of makes perfect sense that there's also a huge amount of infection that's going on in the kidney. And so in terms of the mice, maybe something to think about as well. Um, I think that's a, a really good point. And um one of the things that we've discussed here is whether there's a role for testing urine right. as, we, as we test um, nasopharyngeal swabs. And I think you're, um, you're definitely correct. Um, this is where you see a lot of expression here. I'm showing the tubules, not in the glomeruli. And right, right. I think it's in select tubules. I don't know whether it's in the distal or proximal, but you could yes, probably that was my question. That was my thought as well. I couldn't figure out from the TMA where it was. <laughs> Or if it made a difference. Yeah, really good point. Thanks. Uh, hello, Sandy. It's Raul here. Um, yeah. I, I seem to recall ACE2 expression in placenta. Do you, do you know anything? Did you come across that? Because I was surprised that the, so far there seem to be limited uh, reports on pregnancy problems. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I'd be happy to learn more about that. Uh, does anyone online know? There was a report, I think, in last week's New England Journal about pregnant women that were coming into New York, but the main focus was the fact that about a quarter of them were asymptomatic, but they were positive. But they didn't, I didn't see anything about outcomes in terms of what their, feed, you know, what their kids were like. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think there's plenty more we could just discuss, but I want to turn it over to um, Jerry and Stephanie. I'll let you guys arm wrestle for who goes first. Okay, great. All right, so I'll, I just want to summarize first and show a few slides, and then Stephanie will um, give you the more recent stuff, but it's very similar, I think. Um, Anyway, uh, so I worked um, on coronaviruses since my PhD thesis on uh, FIP a long time ago at Davis. Mm. And then I maintained an interest in coronas because MHB it, in mice and NIH and elsewhere. And then 10, over 10 years ago, I worked on SARS in different species, rats, I mean mice, 
monkeys, uh, ferrets, and hamsters, and the, with mostly one strain. So the strain of the virus and the species makes a big difference. This is a summary table that it's fairly accurate. It's not exactly accurate. It depends maybe on your point of view. So for example, in humans, it's not just true with this first SARS virus. It's also, it seems to be true with MERS and with SARS-2. Um, generally, interstitial lesions are the most important thing, but the other factors as well, and I'll mention that in the next slide. And mortality, of course, very high with uh, MERS and SARS-2 and much lower with SARS-1, actually, or no, it's higher with SARS-1. Anyway, mice, when you, different strains of mice are, are susceptible, but just barely, they get typical respiratory tract infection, clears in five to seven days, and they, they don't have much mortality, no mortality. But if you age, use aging mice or you adapt the virus to mice, um, it becomes more virulent. In fact, the mouse adapted virus has multiple uh, develops mutations, which allows it to infect in more uh, uh, direct ways. And hamsters are very, I'll show you hamsters because they're very, very great interstitial lesions, but not quite the same as humans as well. Ferrets, ferrets and monkeys are interesting. In, in uh, the real expert on pathology of these respiratory coronaviruses is our Dutch colleague and ACBP diplomate, uh, Thies Kuken at um, Erasmus Medical School. And he's published a lot on these, all these different viruses. We tried to get him on today, but he couldn't do it. Um, so in the United States, ferrets don't die, but in, in ferrets and monkeys die in the Netherlands, and they have more severe lesions. I don't know why. It might be related to the housing type being different. Okay, so the important thing I want to point out here is in humans, and you can see this, the slides that were published um, that um, Sandy just showed, the published paper of human um, lung lesions, which have been called DAD, or diffuse alveolar damage. I think this is a lesion that, most animals, probably all animals, don't really get. They, it's been published as monkeys and some other types of experiments. You do get this, but it's kind of a stretch. And I've seen a recent paper on monkeys, um, which has focal edema, and they call it dad. So you have to be real careful there. Stephanie will probably say something about this in her mind. Anyway, so this is a very specific thing in humans. It's really severe, and it relates not only to viral infection, I think, of the type 1 and type 2 cells, but probably other factors related to vascular, the uh, vascular system, thrombosis, and other things. Massive hemorrhage was in those, some of those slides you showed. There's some online sites now of the human disease. Anyone interested, just email me. There's an NIH website of human autopsy cases and digital slides. And you can see the massive hemorrhage is amazing and the hypertrophy, hyperplasia of the type 2 and type 1 cells. Anyway, so that's a big difference, I think. Okay, and then we're going to go to a few digital slides here. Um, so first, I'm going to show you a typical mouse infection, at least in our experiences. Uh, Dr. Kanta Subaru at NIH, a virologist who led all these studies, and she's now in Australia at an influenza center. <clears throat> anyway, so here's a typical immunostaining. This is an antibody, uh, actually hyperimmune serum from, from mice that survived. And so it's a mouse polyclonal, and you'll see there's plasma staining. You can see my hand, it's very small. In the blood vessels, the plasma stains. But the viral infected um, epithelial and clara cells mostly are infected and get necrosis. There isn't much of any alveolar. There's a few cells in the alveoli that are positive, uh, but very few. So that's sort of typical of different strains of mice. <clears throat> and even knockouts, interfering on knockouts that we worked on, we thought that would play a role in the pathogenesis. It had no effect. Only one mouse strain, which I'll show you the last, had uh, an effect on the pathogenesis. Okay, so. Um, so this other, this is a strain that was more susceptible, even at day, this is day three. And the same antibody, you can see much larger areas of massive necrosis, more, more uh, involvement of the, uh, more widespread involvement of the uh, bronchioles, um, but not, still not much involvement of the, um, al of the uh, alveolar cells, maybe some, anyway. But what's interesting about this one strain is that it, does, it dies, 100% death, but later. They recover from this acute infection, and they develop lesions that progress. So here, this, again, is not dads like in um, humans. Um, so this is a day seven in this knockout line. And you can see much more severe involvement of airways and alveoli around it. Um, 
and the Croesus and all kinds of stuff. But what's really interesting is by day 14 to 22, they get these gross lesions and grossly fibrinous peritonitis, just like FIP. And actually, these lesions, to me, resemble FIP, except they're much larger. So basically, they're, this is H&E. They're focal lesions. There's necrosis and massive infiltration of neutrophils. There's macrophages on the outside. And outside here, you can even see large numbers of plasma cells. This is rit erythropoiesis. Lots of plasma cells on the outside. So if you stain this now, this is a stain using the hyperimmune serum. So all the plasma is staining. And so we, had, we do have specific staining in the slide. So in the macrophages surrounding the focal uh, lesions, you can see, I'm trying to find a better area here. It is an area. You can see it, these are the macrophages and they're positive, strongly positive. Also outside the plasma cells are strongly positive, in it, but they look different morphologically and they're actually not as intensely staining as the macrophages. So the virus is infecting the macrophages and the lesions by some immune unknown mechanism still not studied we published this over 10 years ago. Um, Matt Freeman, who's, who was at UNC, Ralph Barrick's virology group that Stephanie now works with. Um, he's at University of Maryland now. He, he worked on this and he's still doing some work on this. And one of our colleagues at Hopkins is helping him with the pathology. So anyway, this is, this is not obviously dads. Um, in this slide also, I think there's a piece of lung. Let's see, I can show you the lung. Um, and I don't have the, the H&A, but I just have the, here it is. No, that's not the lung. The lung is in another slide somewhere. But the lung has the same thing. The lung has these um, py large pyogranulomatous lesions, um, not a severe interstitial pneumonia, as you might expect. So anyway, so that was interesting. So the mouse basically gets a typical, with SARS-1, which you might call SARS-1, but it's called SARS coronavirus, the first one. Um, just get a typical respiratory infection that clears, and in this strain, this knockout, which is STAT1 knockout, this was published um, by two different groups, the one I was working with, as well as uh, uh, Washington University St. Louis first published this. Um, for some reason, not worked out yet, they get that. But humans don't get this, so we don't have to worry about it, although there is some evidence of infection of other tissues of humans, as, as uh, Sandy mentioned. So the last thing I'll show you fairly quickly um, this is a different species, and this is day, um, see, day five. So you can see at day five, there's more extensive lesions, interstitial lesions, especially, and thickening of the, alve uh, of the alveolar walls, inflammatory cells, neutrophils, macrophages present. And, um, but most of the lung isn't that bad, and these animals actually get sick, but they don't die. Um, and the airways, the uh, alveoli are much more severe lesions than in the airways. You can see there are lesions in the airways, but not massive necrosis and so on. So using uh, um, immunohistochemistry, this is, let's see, also day five. And it's, this is dramatic, and it's really probably related to the human infection. The alveoli are loaded with antigen, uh, probably type 1 cells. In areas you can see flat flat cells. I can't go any higher. Sorry about that. But most of these cells are flat. There's also some macrophages and probably type two cells infected. So this you don't see in the mouse very much, and it's more extensive in the hamster, and it's also seen in monkeys. Um, of course, the strain of the virus and the strain or species species and strain of the animal plays a role as well. Okay, so that's all I wanted to show. I wanted to emphasize that the human lesions are not really seen diffusely in animals. There is a difference. Um, maybe some of you online, we have a great group online here, all my colleagues and friends, many of you work with mice and some of you probably work with this virus or one of these three viruses. Uh, some of our colleagues are not online who are actually working with the, the viruses right now. Okay, thank you. Any comments, questions until uh, Stephanie will present more recent research on MERS and SARS-2. So, um, so I have I have one practical question, Jerry, which is this um, antibody staining with the hyperimmune serum that you used. Is that available? Is yeah. that something we can well distribute? Uh, I can tell it came from NID, and the person, the, Dr. Sabaro, is not there anymore. But there is people that can, if you want to get it, I can probably find somebody that'll send it to you. The NID group working with it now is the Rocky Mountain Lab, and 
Dana Scott is the veterinary pathologist there that's been working on this. He's on the first monkey paper. Um, I can put you in contact with them and so on. So, but you want probably a more specific serum. I think there are, Stephanie will probably tell you the ones that she's used or that are probably commercially available more specifically to specific antigens. Well, I will say this actually looks very good and partly, I guess that may be because it's on hamster, but um, this is this is nice staining. It was a question um, about which knockout there was. Was it the interferon knockout that I think you told no, us no, it, it stat, not, knock, no, stat no, one knockout? Stat one knockout only. And that's been published and uh, Matt Freeman's the senior author. I, was, I can, you can do a, a search for Ward JM SARS and you'll find four papers there. And one's by Matt Freeman at, who's at University of Maryland right now. And he has a lot of pathology that he did himself on the lung. It doesn't show much, but our supplemental figure shows all those STAT1 lesions that are great. The, the first paper on STAT1 from Worcester uh, also had some pathology, but they actually missed most of the lesions I just, I just described. Uh, a comment, Chair, this is Marcus Bosenberg. Um, the human side of pathology, the, including you know, diffuse alveolar damage, uh, is generally a post-ventilator phenotype, which you're not really gonna mimic in any of the models. And I think that's probably a pretty important and relevant thing. Most of the pathology that you were showing seemed pretty uh, multifocal, but nonetheless focal, uh, and, which is really in contrast to DAD that one sees in a variety of contexts, which are almost all post-ventilator, uh, not just associated with SARS. Um, and I think that's something yeah. to, to keep in mind. The hemorrhage, I would think the massive hemorrhage, right? It's not, it's, not, it's not just the hemorrhage, actually. You get fibrosis, uh, you know, or hyalinization of alveolar spaces and things like that that seem to uh, correlate with the uh, decreased uh, ability to exchange gas. So it, it really, the, the, the name actually is somewhat accurate. Actually, this is just a hamster again. I found the areas where there's protein in alveoli um, there's, there's one paper recently that describes this as VADS, but to me it's uh, probably edema, but it could be other stuff as well. You can see that here. So it, you can, uh, you know, people take pictures of one little area and they say it's just like the human disease and it really isn't. Yeah, I don't think it is. I think uh, the human side is a lot less focal and a lot more diffuse, but it's almost always post-ventilator. And it could be that the ventilation part is what's causing the common pathology across different etiologies for the lung disease. So I think if one had autopsy series in humans of uh, patients that were not ventilated, that would probably be the most accurate view in comparing with the models. Right. The one thing about the human one, the, the pictures that uh, Sandy showed in the uh, online website at NIH, you have great w thickening of the alveolar walls by type 1, type 2 cells and macrophages, and that is dramatic, but that, that itself wouldn't kill the person, obviously. Okay, Corey's okay, got a couple. Seven. Corey's got a Corey, couple more okay. questions in the chat. Uh, so um, she asked, um, "Is there any information on the similarities between IN infection of mice with MHV? Um, the lesions that I've seen look more like the acute human disease to me." Um, and then she also comments, "Were all of these scheduled sacrifices?" I saw a way worse vascular lesion in some flu case found dead than in the scheduled sacs. Exactly. Yeah, well, obviously, most of the virologists kill the animals before when they're sick uh, or when they're not sick, when they recover. So uh, you're right. The, we didn't see the animals die. Uh, but the mortality is studied. In, in these studies, the animals, the only, the stat ones did die progressively from two to three weeks after exposure. Um, from that lesions I showed you, but the other animals, they, the survival, they lost weight and then they recover. So it's maybe different with MERS and with SARS too. Stephanie will tell you that. Um, I, so I'll kind of pick off uh, up as best I can where Jerry left off. I agree with the comments he was saying, um, everything being said, I came in um, at UNC, we have a pretty large coronavirus group that dates back three decades, starting with mouse hepatitis virus and then uh, moving to SARS and MERS. 
Um, most of the work I've done with them is m more MERS than SARS because of the timing of it, that SARS kind of went away and MERS kept popping back up. So we were doing therapeutic studies in MERS, assuming that that was an ongoing problem. Um, in January of this year, we had 20 SARS mice alive. <laughs> so those got quickly bred up again. Um, Stan Perlman, who, has the other, who designed the other mouse that we were talking about today for SARS uh, with the ACE2 receptor at, at Iowa, he had zero mice. And so he is on the list trying to get mice um, sent back to him as well, just like everybody else. But I wanted to first highlight this website um, they put up a new page here on the MGI site for mouse models of coronavirus infection that kind of lists um, the SARS mice and the MERS mice. It's a nice resource if you're trying to look at how they were designed. Very useful. Um, I don't have any MERS, or I'm sorry, I don't have any SARS, I'm at home, <laughs> and I don't have any SARS slides here at home with me. I do have a MERS slide I can show you. Um, I think my SARS experience very much mirrors what Jerry already showed. Um, I think the big difference between MERS and SARS in mice, from what I've seen, is that SARS tends to hit the bronchi and bronchioles more than MERS. The MERS disease is more truly interstitial in the mouse model. Um, I, so I'll show you a couple of pictures and then I have a, a live slide I can show you. So this is the Remdesivir publication um, that is actually, if we've got just one minute for a fun aside story. Uh, um, uh, this, <laughs> so I was called, historically the coronavirus group didn't use a veterinary pathologist. I came in uh, and really started working more intensively with them about a year ago. Um, and interestingly, they had submitted a paper on using remdesivir as a therapeutic, either post-exposure or prophylactically um, and in mice. It, this is in collaboration with Gilead, who you've heard in the news. And last summer, they had submitted this without uh, pathology, without a veterinary pathologist. And they got pretty harsh reviews back and said, you really need to find a pathologist, at which point I'd kind of been working with them already. We really worked up the pathology on this model. I was really excited. I thought we were going to resubmit it and they were going to regret asking for the help of a veterinary pathologist um, because we added all these beautiful figures. Much to my surprise, I was responsible for getting it rejected <laughs> because they did not believe my pathology. And I firmly believe it's because it's an interstitial phenotype and it was very hard for a reviewer who didn't have a pathology background to appreciate hypercellularity um, and not giant cuffs of lymphocytes around an airway. Um, so that's why this figure now has all these annotations in it um, and a mock <laughs> that shows very thin alveolar septa right next to hypercellular ones. And so in this figure, you can see um, kind of the phenotype of the MERS infection, where there's hypercellularity with mononuclear cells. Um, and then there is some protein in the air spaces and mild kind of early hyaline membrane formation. I don't think mice do a great job of making the really robust hyaline membranes like you see in humans. Um, one thing that the authors had, or I'm sorry, that the reviewers had asked for after, oh, so fun part of the story, I guess, is that I was responsible as a pathologist for getting this paper rejected. We wrote a letter to the editor begging them that if they had a pathologist review my pathology comments, I promised that they would agree that any of the four panels to the right did not match the panel to the left and in fact were diseased because what the reviewer had said was that there was no pathology to be seen, um, that these looked like normal lungs, which is not right. Um, so they had asked us to uh, go back and somehow quantitate this based on something that had already been established. Um, and so in the literature, there's not a great scoring scheme for this phenotype in mice. Um, we pulled on two things. One, the American Thoracic Society has a lung injury score shown up there to the left that I have pulled up here. Um, it has these five features. And it's not great, honestly, for SARS and MERS, um, but it's something. And what it 
I don't think it captures the lesions perfectly, but it does capture some element that does quantify the severity and it made the reviewers happy. Um, for instance, um, I do not, so between the SARS and the MERS mouse that I work with, um, the MERS mouse just has more neutrophils in circulation and that's, and one of the criteria for grading has to do with how many neutrophils are in the interstitial space. And so that, that metric is kind of useless completely honest. The other thing is the whole infection itself isn't very neutrophilic. It's much more lymphocytes and macrophages. So this isn't a great scoring scheme for it, it, its particular features. But like I said, that said, it is a metric that does seem to capture the severity. Um, and so it ends up that the, the ATS, the American Thoracic Society, is um, reevaluating this paper as a consensus paper that came out a couple of years ago. They're currently doing that right now and we wrote them before all of this happened actually and said please consider infectious models more heavily next time around because this tends to be um, more uh, toxicity in acute lung injury. The other thing we did was we also um, utilized uh, from the University of Iowa. Um, this is the group that's out there, including um, David Meyerholtz, um, who's a diplomat. Um, on, it, the, he has a, a scoring scheme for DAD in mice in this paper. Um, this is a respiratory syncytial virus paper, and this similarly mirrored the ATS scoring that we did. It's shown here. It's just a very simple one, two, three, four um, scoring scheme that we applied. So it worked. Um, and this is the, actually was um, the, what we were doing with this manuscript was we were actually trying to get Gilead to start clinical trials in Saudi Arabia with this, um, presuming that there would be another outbreak. Um, that was supposed to start happening this spring, obviously. Um, clinical trials are going on in the U.S. now with it. Um, and so far, so good. Uh, I think in the beginning we mentioned um, the endosomes, and that is the theory behind the hydroxychloroquine that you hear as a treatment, um, that the uh, hydroxychloroquine alters the acidity of the um, endosomes, and that was kind of the thought behind why it might work or not. Um, What's the two-sentence version of how remdesivir works? It, it, it's, a, it's an antiviral for RNA viruses. It introduces mutations to um, the replication cycle, so you're getting transcripts that are stopped short, so the virus can't replicate. Um, somebody had asked about the... Um, so moving away from MERS and going back to SARS-1, I guess we might call it now, and SARS-2. Um, this is the, an antibody that we use. It's a wonderful antibody for SARS, and it works on SARS-2 as well. Um, it's pretty dummy-proof, to be completely honest. It's, a, it's an excellent reagent. And it cross-reacts. It's the nucleocapsid, and it's a rat, rat, rabbit polyclonal. And as far as I've heard, despite it being commercially available, there has not been. Like, they have plenty of it, so. Um, let's see, I think Jerry covered basic SARS pathology pretty well. Um, the, I, I, I actually have some SARS-2 pathology, but to be completely honest, I don't want to share that if we're recording this. Um, what I'll say, I, I, I won't share the slides that I have. What I'll speak to, I guess, is the, um, is kind of the process that we've gone through so far. Um, so, much like for SARS, um, it uses the same receptors, so those mice work. Um, we have a mouse adapted version of the virus now that causes disease. Um, there's replication in the nasal cavity as well as in the lung. We've looked at a couple tissues for outright path pathology um, that's just starting literally this week, and I haven't seen anything. We looked at heart. Um, lung, liver, 
nose and kidney. Um, heart because of what was being reported with the um, hydroxychloroquine and I didn't see any um, overt replication in the heart or anything like that. The kidneys we haven't evaluated yet and same with the liver. Um, but we are getting nice replication of the mouse adapted version of the virus in the nasal cavity and the lung. Um, the mouse adapted version of the virus is, is, is just an engineered two amino acid substitution um, in the receptor binding site. And the other thing to remember about coronaviruses is that the genome is a swarm. So um, any kind of clone that you have of it is still a swarm genome. Um, like I said, I don't feel comfortable showing you those slides since we're recording, but I do have a couple human COVID cases. If I can switch over to my microscope, I'll show that. Um, if, you, if you want, um, and we'll break at the end, I can stop the recording and if you want to share those. Uh, but I would still remind everybody that that's not to be discussed outside of this group. Um, but I leave that up to you either way. Okay. Um, so, what I, can you see my microscope now? I hope. Um, Not yet. You may have to unshare and reshare. Oh, let me see. I'll stop sharing. Excuse me, this is Jerry again. I put up the website in the in the uh, chat thing about the NIH uh, uh, digital slides for human pathology. So, uh, have fun. Thanks, Jerry. Can you see my microscope now? Uh, it's coming. It says started sharing, but it hasn't come up yet. Um, so there's some dirt on. Here it goes. Now we can see your microscope. Okay. So I would. Uh, so at, at UNC, um, we have decided not to do autopsies on patients that die of COVID to be sensitive to not exposing extra people and not using extra PPE. So these cases actually we have gotten um, sent to us from other institutions um, and we get spoiled in veterinary medicine um, in, in especially in what we do in comparative pathology that we get very fresh cases. Um, the patient I'm showing today was a 40 year old male found dead. So no treatment um, in the hospital, but was COVID positive or SARS-2 positive. Um, because of the, um, uh, I guess, I'm sorry, in human medicine, it's called found deceased, not found dead, like we call it. <laughs> um, because of that, though, there is not any epithelium lining bronchi or bronchioles in this patient. Um, what you can appreciate is um, very similar to what I've seen in MERS, um, a, an interstitial pneumonia, pretty severe congestion. I know we don't know what side was down in this patient, but pretty much all sections have severe congestion, edema, um, early hyaline membrane formation, and then um, lymphocytes, macrophages, alveolar max, but not really um, much of a neutrophilic response, and again, not much of the kind of cuffing that you would see with flu or something like that around the larger airways. It, in, in the, I've seen two human patients and they both had a much more interstitial disease. Um, and to my knowledge, both of these, the patients I saw were not vented or treated. Um, but, it, but one thing that is quite different from the two human patients versus our, our um, mouse model is the diffuseness of disease. Whereas, um, similar to what Jerry was saying with the mice, um, I tend to see multifocal lesions, particularly most severe lesions underneath the pleural surface, um, versus the human patients, it seems to be pretty diffuse destruction throughout. Um, we have started, there's a question on aging. Um, we did young mice and old mice when it comes to SARS-2. Um, with our mouse adapted strain, that is ongoing. I've seen an N of four mice, too young and too old, um, on Monday of this week. And for us, so far, the young mice are showing more severe disease than the old mice, for what that's worth. It's pretty early. Um, and I think 
that's kind of all my talking points um, without sharing. I can, like I said, if we stop recording, um, I could share some of the other stuff. Um, Your wish is my command. I'm about to stop recording.